I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Nick Cook, award-winning aerospace and defense journalist, former aviation editor of Jane's Defense Weekly, best-selling author of The Hunt for Zero Point, and the founder of New Action Global Consultancy. Nick joins us to discuss his research into emerging aerospace technologies, defense industry black projects, and his call to action on a cross-sector cross initiative to find solutions to global challenges. So Nick, let's start with The Hunt for Zero Point, which is your best-selling book on black projects from the aerospace defense world. Now you published that nearly two decades ago, and I'm wondering, have you been surprised by the relevance and the continued relevance, as well as the public reaction to it that it's had over the last two decades? Well, I have been surprised by it really, Tim. And um, I guess in part because for a long time, I just put it on a shelf. I put it on the shelf and it just stayed there. I never sort of re-examined it. I went on to do other things. Um, so for about sort of a decade or more, I, I didn't revisit it at all. And people would contact me, of course, about, you know, uh, some of the stuff that's in the book. But I was, you know, rather perhaps unkindly dismissive of that sometimes. I mean, in that um, I, I didn't quite appreciate some of the impact that it, it had had. And of course, people wanted to talk about it. But for me, I'd sort of for a while as I I'm trying to explain, I guess I kind of tried to move on and away from it. It was so uh, all encompassing for me for the 10 years that I've been doing the research that I wanted to go on to other things afterwards. But what I'm really gratified about now is that a lot of the themes in it have started to come back. In fact, they've started to surface for the first time, some of them. And when I sort of dipped back into the book again, to sort of try and wonder or try and answer the question as to why people were interested in it again. I did see that it had relevance today that um, I really found surprising. And, and I'm, I'm glad too in that sort of, you know, it's, it, it hasn't become outdated as I thought it might, which, you know, is, is, is for me is a very gratifying thing. And I'm delighted now to be talking about it again because it all feels to me fresh and new and you know sort of I'm kind of exploring the issues with everyone else uh almost like it's the first time yeah well and I should apologize for jumping around a little bit in the questions but you know when you mentioned trying to get away from it one of the things that I've noticed is and, and this is just my perception as journalists you kind of you, you, you dip into the water of all of these different little ponds, right? And so as an aerospace reporter, I know you used to go to conferences, report on new technology. And then for Zero Point, I mean, it, you were heavily involved, but that's only one project in a large scope of interest and work. So I, I think maybe one of the challenges is per, perhaps it's almost like, uh, like with actors where they worry about being stereotyped, right? We, we, I, I, I'm not sure if that resonates at all, but, but that's one of the things I've wondered because I, I have that as well. I have many different interests. And, and so when I'm writing about a topic, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge sometimes to kind of pull back from that and say, okay, this project is done now I'm moving on. You know? Oh, I definitely go along with that. I mean, I'm a complete polymath. And um, uh, although my core interest, my background, my training, is, uh, was and is in aerospace and defense. Um, I, you know, I've got a lot of interest outside of that and, and the Hunt for Zero Point tapped into many of them. I mean, people will be aware that in addition to the exploration of a technology frontier, uh, there was also uh, some history in there. I'm, you know, I'm very interested in World War II. There's also some sort of ideology in there. You know, what is the, um, what are the sort of the, uh, the the sort of mind slash consciousness implications of a new energy source? Um, so all of that sort of came into play in the hunt for zero point in a, in, in a way. And yeah, I, I I for a while I tried to put it into a sort of silo and move on and and did. I mean I, I perhaps we'll discuss some of them. You know I went on to other areas. And then, as I say, you know, I sort of, I, I came back to it. I mean, initially I was dragged back to the Hump Zero Point 
uh, almost kicking and screaming, but you know, actually in the past couple of years, and you know, it'd be interesting for us perhaps to explore what has made the book come back again. I suspect that some of it is Tic Tac related, you know, the sightings of, uh, or the, the uh, encounters of the US Navy uh, of its two carrier battle groups in the Pacific and the Atlantic um, of a, you know, uh, UAP encounter, unidentified aerial phenomena, formerly known as UFOs. Um, I think that might explain some of it, but I don't, I don't think it explains all of it. So, um, you know, um, you probably have better ideas on that than I do. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it is intriguing. You know, there was, there was an enormous revelation in the hunt for zero point uh, when you talked about the Nazi bell. So I, I think that the Nazi bell was probably the biggest revelation in the book, which was a secret project that Polish defense journalist Igor Witkowski discovered initially at the Wenceslas mine in Poland. So back when you wrote the book, it was conjectured that the Nazis were trying to build some new kind of propulsion system. But since then, scientists have suggested that the facility might have been used for refining thorium for the German nuclear bomb program. Have you been able to find anything more out about the Nazi Bell project? And do you think that it was more likely that it was some kind of propulsion system research or, or, or was it something more mundane like nuclear research? So, um, yes, I guess a year or two after I, the, the Hunt for Zero Point was published, um, I became involved in an attempt to track down one of the uh, arch antagonists of the Hunt for Zero Point, Hans Kammler. Uh, for those who wouldn't know about Hans Kammler, he was a uh, SS uh, general, a uh, very senior one, appointed by Hitler to, uh, at the end of the war, to oversee all Nazi Germany's secret weapons projects. Kammler disappeared off the face of the earth at the end of the war. And what I found deeply suspicious uh, was that there were sort of six different accounts of his death, you know, which is kind of a surefire pointer to the fact that, uh, you know, he, he, his, his disappearance was not coincidental and he, and, he, and he went somewhere. So uh, with a band of researchers, uh, we set out to find what happened to him. Now, I'm not going to steal their thunder because actually these guys uh, went on to write a book about it and it came out last year and it was called uh, The Hidden Nazi. And it was written by a guy called uh, Colm Lowry and uh, Dean Reuter and Keith Chester, three of them mm. wrote it. And they found, or rather, actually we found Kamler, um, when, when, this is when I was involved in this, but I had other things going on um, and they went on to write the book. It's, it's a compelling read because at the heart of it and at the heart of your question, is the whole issue of uh, the Nazis' uh, development of an atomic bomb. Uh, there are, uh, there is a sort of, weirdly, a white world version of this story, and there's a black world version of this story. The white world story is about the, 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 the official development of the German atomic weapon, which was run through Werner Heisenberg's program, didn't come to anything, as we all know, thank goodness. Uh, but there was a secret. SS run uh, project behind that, which Kamala had oversight of. And I, in the Hunt for Zero Point, whilst uh, of course that was pursuing an, a, an energy and anti-gravity theme, uh, and Igor Witkowski, you know, particularly was looking at the bell as the source possibly of all kinds of weird experimentation into the manipulation of, of, of uh, time and space, Actually, the simpler explanation, and one which the hunt, you know, uh, touches on as probably more likely, uh, was uh, some kind of um, attachment to the German bomb program. Mm. So, and that actually, I, you know, without a shadow of a doubt to me, that now is what it was involved in. I mean, it may have had some spin-off. Uh, application to something to do with, 
you know, uh, the rotation of magnetic fields and magnetic fields having some spin-off uh, um, uh, application to propulsion. But I genuinely don't think that's uh, where it was intended to go. And it was some form of, uh, I think, some form of enrichment device uh, for, um, for, for this SS run uh, atomic bomb program. Ah, uh, uh, you know, and it, it's interesting, actually. I think it was Eric W. Davis who had told me this was several years ago, but, but he was talking about thorium refining. There was, there was thorium in the mountains. I hope it was thorium. And, and then he said, I said, well, what about the, you know, what about the fly trap? And he said, well, those were supports for a cooling tower for the water. And, and I thought, you know, that does make a lot of sense. So, yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah. And actually, somewhere in the hunt, it says that it says, well, it could be the fly trap or it could be the cooling tower for uh, some form of, you know, uh, or the support stand for a cooling tower um, in an atomic weapons program. But, you know, um, the, the one thing I think one should never do in this business is remain fixed and rigid to a single yeah. point of explanation because, uh, you know, this is an ever fluid landscape, I think, you know, this whole business of, you know, whether you're looking into alternative energy uh, experimentation, whether you're looking into stories about UFOs, you know, whatever it might be in that domain, um, this, you, you, one would be very foolish, I think, to adopt a rigid sort of stand on, on, on these issues because new information comes in all the time. And, uh, you know, I think one should reserve the right to, to, to change one's opinion. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would, I would absolutely agree with that. You, you're finding bits and pieces, trying to fit them together based on what you know, and then what you know changes over time. And so it makes sense that that picture shifts. So yeah, I would completely agree. Well, so you've written, you mentioned writing books on, on World War II. You've written other books since then, uh, Angel, Archangel, The End of the Third Reich, and Aggressor, which is a best-selling military techno thriller. So these were both forays into period-based fiction, right? I, I'm wondering what inspired you in that direction after starting out with HCP, which was really, uh, I guess, more investigative journalism. Well, those books that you mentioned, I actually wrote uh, a long time ago. I mean, that, that was way before the hunt. I wrote uh -huh. those, those were my very first forays into writing. Um, so while I was at Jane's Defense Weekly, um, uh, I was in my 20s, actually. And I, I, I literally thought I have, you know, I have a bit of spare capacity on my hands. Um, I've learned uh, to type <laughs> through my <laughs> journalistic job. You know, what else can I do? And it was a rather sort of dry mechanistic process that led me to write those two two thrillers. Uh, one, as you say, was set in the Second World War and another one was set uh, in the then contemporary Middle East. I mean, to give you an indication of how long ago it was, it was set actually just around the first Gulf War. So ah. 19, 1991. Um, and, and that was pursuant to another sort of interest of mine, which is uh, I have a degree in Arabic and Islamic studies. So, you know, that, that I, I know the Middle East or I knew the Middle East. I've spent some time there um, as a student. My parents were diplomats, so I spent some time in the Middle East. So, uh, as you can see, I've sort of, you know, I've, I've followed my interests and, and where I've not had an outlet for those through journalism, I've often pursued them through storytelling. Uh, and in fact, that's what I'm doing now. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that Corp for corporate institutions, um, having learnt along the way that actually you can combine your interests, you can uh, maintain your position as a storyteller. So I write books. Currently, I'm writing fiction. Um, but then on, you know, there's that sort of uh, there's a that's the right side of my brain, and then on the left side, which is more data analytical and number crunchy. Uh, I satisfy that through working with corporations to tell their stories and those predominantly sort of fall into, again, areas I'm interested in, which are defense and security, but also the environment, because, you know, I've, I, I mean, 
you know, who can't now uh, recognize that, you know, the planet's in trouble. There are uh, all kinds of uh, terrifying environmental issues out there. So I found outlets for, for that as well. So uh, yeah, it, it's, the, the more I go on with this, the older I get, the, the more I realize that actually you can, as Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss and, uh, you know, do the things that you're really interested in and, you know, fingers crossed, make a living out of it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and so the consulting is intriguing too. I've, I've gone to your website and I believe that was New Action Global, although you, you've also had a consulting company called Dynamics in the past. But um, so with the New Action Global effort though, I, I'm wondering, um, you know, how that came together and, and really what you mentioned that it's, it's corporate storytelling. And actually I've seen some of the pitches that you've had online for that. I think those are wonderful. And so I, I wanted to ask just more about what that is, how that came together. And I guess some of the companies that you were able to talk about doing consulting work for so far. So uh, a couple of years ago, I founded the storytelling venture, which goes uh, under the name of MCW, which stands for uh, nickcook.works, which is the, um, the, the domain name. Uh, so that, as I say, is, is, has been around uh, doing work for in the areas I'm interested in. So it's about helping companies tell the stories they want to tell or should be told in order to reach target markets or uh, even in some cases tell their own employees what they're up to. So you bring the employees along with them. Um, uh, and obviously most of the, the clients are confidential, but you know, I've done work for uh, some large aerospace companies. I've done some sustainability work for some very large uh, um, sort of uh, commercial uh, uh, companies. Um, so uh, and again, it, 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 as I say, it sort of merges those, those interests of mine, which are essentially to do with technology and storytelling. Um, out of that work, um, at the beginning of this year, um, uh, and because a number of us have aerospace and defense sector backgrounds, we, like many other people, were um, you know, in shock from the onset of the pandemic. We here in the UK were locked down pretty quickly. Um, and the guys that I work with on the storytelling venture said, well, what can we do in, in order to do our bit? You know, we, we see health workers doing their thing. I mean, lots of people were doing their thing. And for a while, we all sort of felt rather powerless. So uh, it was at that point I thought, well, actually, the whole idea of engaging the aerospace and defense sector in uh, global challenge solutions you know, that, as you said, that was something that I had done a decade ago through Dynamics, which was then a consultancy working very closely with those aerospace and defense companies. We said this time, or I said this time, well, let's do this uh, on a pro bono level. Uh, we will interview people who uh, uh, believe, like I do, that aerospace and defense can act in a particularly in a sort of systems engineering and a systems of systems solutioneering capacity on very large architectural challenges you know most global challenges like climate change or food and water security or uh you know uh, environmental pollution would fall into that bracket uh and you know let's interview people who believe like we do that the sector can help and see where it goes. And that's what we did. And we posted, I don't know, maybe 20 interviews or so uh, and stories that tell that story. And it really is a, it's a what if story of the future because currently the aerospace and defense sector is not fully engaged in combating uh, these global challenges. Um, it's sort of partially engaged, but you know, when you consider how much uh, expertise the sector has in understanding Earth's ecosystems from space down to subsea and everything in between. Yeah, it has untapped knowledge, much of it, in fact, most of it paid for by governments and the taxpayer that just sits there un, 
unused, untapped, undeployed. And it's that uh, capacity that, you know, my colleagues and I uh, want to see released out there to work with other sectors to combat these challenges. And we're making some progress. So, you know, I'm, I'm pleased about that. But, you know, you asked about how that started and uh, that's really where it went back to. And we had a, we had a, a bit of help actually uh, back in March um, because prior to this, when I'd been working on, on, on this story uh, at Dynamics, um, everyone, a lot of companies and, and people would turn around and say, well, you know, why on earth or how on earth could the aerospace defense and defense sector engage in these challenges? And, and the, the part of the problem was I didn't have an example. I mean, not a really good concrete example, but at the beginning of the pandemic, I mean, lots of companies, certainly here in the UK, but I know also in the US, um, they responded in a heartbeat to the call for uh, personal protective equipment uh, and ventilators and respirators that the hospitals was in, in, in such dire need of. And there was my example. Here was an example of the, uh, of the sector jumping in to develop and manufacture equipment it had no experience of, but it has a very full and flexible supply chain that can do this if it is allowed to flex and flux. And that's what we've got to get it to do. In fact, actually that's, I think what we've got to get uh, supply chains in all sectors to do in the era of the fourth industrial revolution, because actually now they can. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, it, it, it is, it, it's an excellent point. It's an, I, I remember all of the different companies that got involved with making ventilators and they just pivoted on a dime. So yeah, yeah you know. Well, let me get back to defense because I, I wanted to ask a little bit about the culture. Um, you know, a lot of the aerospace industry culture that you explored, and I'm going back to Hunt for Zero Point, but it was formed around an insular Cold War mentality that was heavy on secrecy and compartmentalization. So I'm wondering, is that culture evolving into something that's more open? And do you think organizations like InQtel and the Defense Innovation Unit are products of that increasing awareness of the need for open cross-collaborative defense initiatives? Well, I think actually it's polarizing, funnily enough. I, I, I mean, I don't have anything against secrecy. I mean, countries need to protect their secrets, clearly. And certainly in a era where we are getting back into, you know, great power competitions, um, it is only natural that uh, block, block powers will want to protect their military secrets. Um, I, I think where I have a problem is where you get excessive secrecy and where that culture of secrecy spins out to such a degree that it develops its own uh, its own energy and, and its own sort of impetus and its own rules. And it becomes so opaque that actually, you know, the mechanisms that were set up to oversee it, uh, well, who knows whether they can oversee it or not, because we rarely get a glimpse into that world. And we have to take a lot of it, uh, a lot of the, 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 the accounting mechanisms as an article of faith. So I do have a problem with that. But I think coming the other way, we have an interesting dynamic, which is, you know, as you know, the aerospace and defense sector has always been top heavy when it comes to the average age of, the, of an aerospace engineer. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 10 years ago, it was in the mid 50s. Um, it's coming down. It's probably around the mid 40s now. But, you know, that's still pretty, pretty old for a sector that is, you know, overwhelmingly prides itself on being very technical. And one of the things that, you know, I remember being troubled by about 10 years ago was the thought that, uh, you know, if it is not careful, the sector that I love, and I've grown up through this industry, you know, of, of aerospace, um, this sector that I, I, I loved, I came to admire hugely as a kid, um, I then enjoyed so much working in as a reporter. It is in danger, or was in danger then, of, of its macro innovation drying up. I mean, 
it, micro innovation and, and medium level innovation goes on every day in the aerospace and defense sector. But on a macro level, you know, when was the last time that an Apollo was put together or a space shuttle or a Concorde, you know, or stealth for that matter. Um, and there is plenty of innovation going on in the black world. I mean, we know that. We know that because last month, the US admitted that it had developed a sixth generation fighter and flown it completely in secret. But we don't see that much in the white world anymore. And I think that is troubling. The, the, the good news is, is that there is a, a, a dynamic that's coming the other way, which is the industry itself has recognized that it needs to attract a new generation, you know, millennials and generation Z or Z uh, and beyond. And, and it's not getting them in the quantities that it would like. Why? Because uh, for an industry that has now become heavily software and computerized, uh, computer based, it uh, is competing against Silicon Valley and you know, many other sectors that, that would traditionally poach those sorts of engineers. Um, so it, it, it needs to become more attractive to that Generation Z and millennial component that is required to refresh the industry, to stimulate it. And I think it's telling that the innovation that is really going on in that sector and sort of the three areas I'd quote are space, so SpaceX, um, uh, drones, you know, high street drone type uh, development and manufacture, and also uh, in terms of urban air mobility. You know, these predominantly have come from without, from outside the aerospace sector, not from within it. Um, so something has to change, something has to give, uh, and I think, I mean, I like to think that if you open up the sector to a much bigger mandate, which is uh, sure, protect your, uh, uh, your nation states that are uh, invested in you, but go beyond that too. And instead of looking at just national defense, look at planetary defense, see where you can uh, work with other sectors to provide defense in the round of the planet. And that would mean taking in those global challenge areas like climate, like food and water security, like humanitarian assistance. Uh, so again, it's, you know, we're, we're back to narratives again, Tim, which is, this is, it's how you tell this story. And this really is the, the future story, the story of the future that I want aerospace to tell or I want to be told of aerospace. So, um, and I'm confident it'll happen, um, but it's not happening yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's intriguing. And, you know, and I hope I'm not wearing you out with the questions too. I feel like I'm grilling you on things. I, I'm, I, you know, I feel guilty about that, but, um, you know, you did mention the great powers competition a second ago. And that, to me, that is intriguing because I think that is spurring a lot of innovation as well. And, you know, it seems like, like I've read that the, the military is shifting from desert operations over to uh, South Asia operations and stuff like that. And then I believe that the Space Force was really inspired by this emerging great powers competition too. So I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on that? Um, do you think that that's going to inspire change? And, and then what, what are your thoughts on some of the deteriorating tension, or the deteriorating relationships and increasing tensions that we've had over the last few years with China? Well, I think to take that question first, I mean, that is extremely concerning. Uh, and of course, the battle space itself is extremely fluid. I mean, it is no longer the battle space that was defined by the Cold War, which, you know, effectively took place in three dimensions. You know, we are now fighting in a war is being fought in and on four dimensions. Um, the fourth being the sort of the cyber realm. And uh, warfare itself, as we know, has become so blurred, um, you know, it's, it's, it's now known as hybrid warfare. I mean, there are many names for it, but, you know, I, I, I call it hybrid warfare. You know, we had 
an instance, as you know, a couple of years ago here in the UK, where uh, a, a, a chemical weapon was let loose in a provincial UK town, um, ostensibly to kill a, um, a former Soviet agent, a Russian mm. agent. Um, but, and, and, you know, at some level, by the Russians, that was deemed to be acceptable. Um, in another era, that would have been defined as an act of war that would have triggered a conflict. Um, the conflict that is going on goes on behind the scenes. It goes on in cyberspace. And I think, you know, that aspect is, is deeply troubling. Um, and uh, because the, the boundaries are, are, will it take for that uh, a, a, a conflict arena to you know erupt out of the fourth dimension and into the other three um, is it going to be you know an attack on a critical infrastructure site like a power station or a transport network or a hospital um, you know so uh, those rules are not defined uh, and uh, may not be defined for an awful long time and in the meantime you know uh, we have have to somehow keep the lid on these tensions. Um, but I, I, you know, getting back to another point you made, clearly what big power competition, great power competition is doing is, is, is fueling innovation. I mean, in the same way that the Cold War fueled, I mean, really, it, it, it is in the aerospace and defense field, you know, uh, largely responsible for uh, those sort of iconic uh, uh, um, developments that I referenced a few moments ago, you know, uh, the space race, Apollo, space shuttle, um, stealth, you know, the, these all grew out of a, uh, a, a, a Cold War culture. So who knows what is going to come out of this current paradigm that we're in, this great power competition paradigm. But, you know, I fear that a lot of it is going to be a lot murkier and unpleasant. Uh, than even the some of the horrors that you know that came out of Cold War development. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, so I I also wanted to jump back to Tic Tac because you mentioned that earlier, and I I've got a note here to jump back. But I mean, that's that's probably one of the most intriguing stories that I think has come out of the, the defense environment you know, in the last few years. They released the Tic Tac video, which was the USS Nimitz battle group encounter, I guess. And I, personally, I'm impressed by the openness that they had in coming forward with it. I guess it was leaked before they they went public with it, but but nonetheless, you know. Um, so I, I guess, what are your thoughts in general on how Tic Tac changes things, or does it change things? I guess I'm trying to find a. I, I, it's that search for meaning, right? It's out there. It's making waves. People are talking about it now. Personally, I'm trying to understand what does this mean. Well, I find this intriguing um, because, I mean, five years ago, I wouldn't have touched the Tic Tac story with a barge pole. I mean, it was, you know, to someone of my background, it would have been toxic. Uh, there was so much, it wasn't just the whiff of conspiracy about it. It was sort of, you know, the whiff of uh, um, unreality, surrealness, you know, all of that. Um, but then, you know, strangely and miraculously, the US Navy steps in after these stories have come out. Oh, and, uh, you know, and along the way, as you said, the New York Times had reported on it. Um, and the US Navy goes, this is real. This happened to us. It is genuinely baffling to us. Uh, we have been buzzed by UAP. Uh, unidentified aerial phenomena. They're very careful to say uh, uh, what that, is, you know, or rather they're, they're careful uh, uh, not to say what they think that might be. They stick to the facts. It is unidentified aerial phenomena, nothing more. But still, the videos are released, uh, directives go out to Navy pilots that they can now report on this stuff without fear of that stigma that was previously attached to reporting on UFOs. Um, and suddenly for me, it's sort of like, whoa, uh, you know, I can, I can talk about this stuff. And it's not just me either. You know, 
other people in and around the aerospace and defense field are talking about it because it's kosher and acceptable now to be able to do that because the US Navy has admitted that there is a, a phenomenon that needs to be accounted for and explained. So uh, what do I see? You know, I've seen, um, I mean, other, you know, contemporaries of mine at James, uh, uh, Brian Bender used to be a reporter for James. He's now at Politico and Brian has been leading, um, you know, the stories on uh, Tic Tac and, and other aspects of, you know, these Navy encounters, uh, which, as people know, have now been opened up to congressional inquiry in, in, in the US. So uh, what does it all bespeak? Um, I, I, a shift, I think. I mean, I, I do think it, it speaks of a consciousness shift. I mean, we've just, we, we are undergoing now a year of, uh, let's hope it's you know, not much more than a year of, of, of pandemic and lockdown and, you know, all the the sort of you know the, the the mental shifting that that has has brought with it, but you know with 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 Tic Tac and the Navy's admission and UFOs, you know I think it, it, it's telling us that reality is not as simple as we have come to think of it as being. Um, reality is very fluid. Um, we see only a fraction of it. Uh, we've probably become conditioned over uh, millions of years uh, only to see a fraction of it, the stuff that we need for our survival, and somehow buried within realms and behind, you know, a, a, a sort of shimmering veil, there are other things that we cannot account for, but which are now manifest. I mean, they're out there. People are talking about them. So I think we're in for quite an interesting decade uh, in which we're undergoing a profound consciousness shift because of uh, the impact of COVID and we realize that we're not as secure as we you know, like to think we are. Um, but there are other things happening as well. There are strange paranormal phenomena that uh, are now being talked about, which um, speak to and of things that we don't understand. And I think we need to be candid about that and go, you know, we're not as clever as we uh, like to think we are. And there are still things um, about our world, about our universe that we don't begin to understand. And I think that's exciting. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Nick, let me close by asking where things go next for you. What, what projects are you planning on undertaking next? And where should we be looking for you in the headlines? <laughs> well, I hope they go nowhere near the headlines for a start. Um, but uh, since, uh, let's see, about three years ago, I uh, wanted to get back into uh, books again. And so I started writing, again, uh, fiction. Uh, so in addition to the consulting business, which is sort of like my day job, I've uh, embarked on a couple of thrillers. So the first of them came out uh, at the end of last year, uh, at the end of 20, 2019, and that was uh, a thriller called The Grid, uh, which takes consciousness and the mind as its sort of substrate. Uh, and I weave a heavily fact-based thriller around that. Uh, and then I'm writing uh, a second thriller now. So that is, uh, I'm sort of about halfway through that. And that will come out, I think, in 2022. So uh, in between times, I'm very uh, preoccupied with the call to action, which is this uh, effort to engage aerospace and defense in uh, counter climate change and other global challenges. Uh, the corporate storytelling work continues. My thriller work goes on. So I'm, I'm, I'm busy um, and grateful to be busy. So. Uh, um, and excited, obviously, you know, if we are coming out of pandemic, which, you know, as we speak, Tim, you know, there's been a week's worth of uh, news and speculation about vaccines and, you know, whatever anyone may feel about that, uh, they're offering some hope right now. So, um, you know, uh, I, I like to hope as we come into 2021 that, uh, you know, there are some uh, exciting times ahead. 